Today I want to tell a brief story. This story is one that's played out time and time again. The same characters and the same plot line. And until now, it's had the same finale. So to set our stage, I want to think about a representative watershed with a river draining down from snow-capped mountains. There's ice fields up high, there's glaciers. And the water flows through a series of lakes down into a lowland floodplain. It drains through forests and then ultimately out into the ocean. And our story really starts with a group of salmon that as we know from Salmon 101, spent a lot of their life out in the ocean, feeding, growing. They're anadromous and they are also, uh, they also have homing behavior. They're headed back to their natal streams to spawn. We've learned that. So the first chapter of our story, and it's a story of salmon people interactions, is by harvesting these fish at levels that are unsustainable, which is to say that more adult salmon are caught than the population can withstand. There's not enough salmon that make it to the spawning grounds, there's not enough adults to spawn, and therefore there's not enough small fish to survive to order to make it out into the ocean and ultimately to come back and continue the life cycle. The next chapter in our story is the need of humans out of necessity is to play, have places to live. We need things to eat. And through choices that are made, humans consistently build towns and villages and cities in the lowland parts of watersheds. We build bridges across rivers and we urbanize the lower parts of watersheds. So coupled with urbanization and road building, there's also a need to eat. We need to grow food. And so often forest ecosystems are turned into agricultural ecosystems and where crops are grown, forests are cut down to make space. And that has consequences for a whole host of things. Urbanized areas tend to have more concrete than a forest and water doesn't flow through concrete, but it flows off of it. And when water falls on the concrete, it makes its ways into rivers much more quickly. And it carries with it petroleum products and other wastes from the urban settings into those rivers. And by cutting down trees, that has a whole host of effects on freshwater ecosystems. It changes the flow of the water into the streams. It changes the flow of the sand and the rocks that go from the land into the river. And of course, it changes the water temperature in the rivers by removing the shade of the trees that otherwise would have bordered these small streams and rivers. So the second way in which humans directly interact with salmon is by modifying their habitat. Our third chapter in the story is that humans need for industry and we need in our own homes a source of power. People quickly have realized that rivers represent an untapped and perceived to be clean way to capture energy. And so over and over again, what people have done is build dams on rivers. And behind these dams, there's reservoirs and our lakes that are formed. And we can then, the water can be taken out of those lakes, spilled over the dams, and the energy of that turns turbines to make power. These dams, of course, have direct implications for fish that are headed upstream and are blocked by reaching the upper parts of watersheds by the dams. They also make it much more difficult for small fish to work their way down over these dams. Indeed, sometimes the small fish are plunged so deeply and so quickly off these, these dams that they actually have barrow trauma. It's also known as the bends, the things that divers get when nitrogen bubbles form in their blood. If that weren't enough, the dams create serious bottlenecks where predators and other things can easily prey on both the juveniles and the adults. So the third chapter of our story is the building of dams for hydropower. The final story in which humans and people have interacted over and over is the belief that we can replace what has been lost by excessive harvest, the modification of habitat, and the building of hydropower by the construction of fish hatcheries. And in these hatcheries, people grow fish until they are large enough to be released into the watershed where we hope they will go out into the ocean, where they will feed 
and hopefully survive to come back and not only seed the environment with additional fish, but also to provide people with harvest opportunities. The goal is we will create fish to catch. So the final way that we interact is through the building of these hatcheries. And you might ask yourself, well, what's the problem with hatcheries? And we're gonna be exploring this more in the course. But briefly here, there's well-known issues of ecological interactions between hatchery and wild fish. There's genetic concerns and increasingly clear evidence that hatchery and wild fish compete for the same resources out in the ocean. And of course, despite the widespread occurrence of hatcheries, wild salmon continue to struggle in many parts of the range, which makes clear you can't replace habitat and catch too many fish and build dams by just building a hatchery. Indeed, if hatcheries were the solution, we would not have an issue with wild salmon in many places of the world. So if we step back a bit and summarize, there's those four ways in which humans interact with salmon across the landscape. Through harvest, modifying habitat, building dams and hydropower, and by the building of fish hatcheries. These combine into what's known as the four H's. And in The King of Fish, it's a powerful book written by David Montgomery, he dives into thinking about these four H's, but also suggests that there's really an important fifth H that doesn't get talked about as much. And that's the importance of remembering and knowing this history. And the question becomes whether the remaining places like Alaska, where the story is not yet totally written, whether we'll have a same outcome as in other places, or whether we'll learn from the lessons of history and have arguably a happier ending.